Good morning and welcome as we share together in worship this Sunday morning. There are some announcements that I would share with you. And, and the first is next Saturday, beginning at 10 o'clock, we're going to be taking the first physical steps toward the, the development of our community garden. And that will be the cutting down of some of the scrub trees and one of the partially rotten trees that are on the south part of the church. The one that will be remaining is the big tree by the, the road that offers the most shade. And so we will cut those down and then uh, I have a contractor who will come in and knock out the stumps and take out the roots and that will get us ready for uh, getting the fence contractor and the putting in of a uh, gazebo. And those will be the, the first steps and then we'll be on our way toward uh, planting trees when the time is right. And our community garden will be off to, to a wonderful start. Uh, <clears throat> the other announcement I would share with you is that the news that seems to be coming out about vaccinations is very encouraging. And if it goes according to plan, I would see us meeting together uh, early this summer when it will be uh, safe for us to do so. So I'm encouraged by that news and I hope that uh, we will have everybody vaccinated uh, by the end of May. And so we can meet uh, together uh, maybe in June as, as uh, we long to do, all of us long to do. Uh, those are the announcements that I would share with you this morning. And I would invite you to join with me in uh, affirming our identity in Christ with the prayer of St. Francis. Would you join me as we pray this together? Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, <laughs> let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon, where there is error, truth, where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, <clears throat> it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying to ourselves that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Our opening hymn is Beneath the Cross of Jesus.
and wonderful hymn, and I invite you to take its words to heart. Our scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, I invite you to listen carefully. It is Jesus' first sermon in, in Luke, and I will say a little bit more about that later. But coming from the fourth chapter of Luke, uh, a passage that is rich in images from the Old Testament. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendants, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said to them, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to the widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There also were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up and drove him out of town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Steve Bragginton has shared with me uh, something entitled, uh, Clever Words for Clever Minds. And I want to share a few of these with you today. Uh, arbitrator, a cook that leaves Arby's to work at McDonald's. Bernadette, the act of torching a mortgage. Burglarize, what a crook, crook sees through. Well, somebody who thought of these things had way too much time on their hands, but I'm thankful they did. They're humorous and I've enjoyed reading them and I'm going to enjoy sharing them with you over the coming weeks. So a special thank you to Steve for sending them to me. Uh, but let me tell you, there were no misunderstood words in what Jesus said, and yet they were totally misunderstood. So what in the world am I saying? Well, this sermon is the sermon that is the key to defining our understanding of Luke's gospel. Just like in the gospel of Mark, the Jesus' sermon, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of hand of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Or in Matthew's gospel, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount form the, the first sermon for Jesus in, in that gospel and help us understand all of the gospel. So in Luke, this passage that is rich in Old Testament imagery is Jesus' first sermon. And the people almost understood his words. They understood the prophet Isaiah, and they were amazed. And it wasn't just enough to hear the words, they wanted proof. 
And then Jesus responds in a way they clearly understood. You see, the, the people of Israel at the time of Jesus were so misunderstanding of, of what it meant to be God's chosen people. They thought it meant privilege and status and a special, a special part, place in God's heart that put them above others and better than others and more important than others. And so Jesus clarifies what he said from the prophet Isaiah. There are no people that are forgotten in God's world. Jesus believed in the forgotten people, the ones he mentioned from Isaiah, but also the ones outside of Israel, often treated with great contempt by the Hebrew people. And their response to him was to want to do him in, and yet he simply walked away from them while they were trying to throw him off a cliff. The, the parallel there between his total, complete command of the situation and, and their fury and anger, and he simply walked away from their midst. If we're going to believe like Jesus, we need to believe in the importance of the forgotten people. Sometimes people are forgotten just because they're different from us. And other times they're forgotten because of the structures of our society and culture that ignore certain people. Let's begin with the people who are, are simply different from us, who oftentimes we may be a little bit uncomfortable around because we really don't know them. I learned this lesson powerfully and painfully in the eighth grade during a football game. My grandfather was visiting from from Europe, from Germany, and my parents were at the game and we were in the huddle getting ready to call play when the person next to me, for whatever reason I don't know, looked up into the stands and, and saw my grandfather. And he turned back into the huddle and he said, I think I just saw Hitler here. Well, my grandfather had a mustache that was like that of many men in Germany at, at the time, but he was far from Hitler. And I, I can remember the, the pain that I felt that if he only knew what an incredibly brave and compassionate man my, my grandfather was, how the, he, he was the antithesis of Hitler. But all this teammate was doing was looking from a distance and assuming because of the look of a mustache that my grandfather must have been Hitler. I felt the pain, I felt the rage <clears throat> of that moment. So many times forgotten people are different from us. And yet when we get to know them, we discover they are like us. Many are special in ways we can't even imagine. I've shared many stories of you uh, from Jim Moore's experience in ministry. But one of my favorite is, is when he was uh, serving a church in Shreveport, Louisiana, and a, a calling, pastoral calling committee was coming to, the, to his church to see if he was going to be the candidate they would call to St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Houston, about a 6,000 member church. 
and he got word of their <clears throat> pending arrival on Saturday. And, and the person who told him was said, make sure you, you have a good sermon tomorrow. They're coming to listen to you preach. And, and that's like somebody saying in the middle of a backswing in, in golf, relax. By Saturday, it's way too late. But Sunday came and, and the committee was there and they listened to Jim preach in the first service. And Jim had a <clears throat> standing appointment in the sec between the first and the second services. And he told the members of the committee, um, I have a meeting that is very important for me to be a part of. And so if you'll excuse me, I, I'd like to go be a part of, of this meeting and I will be glad to see you before the next service. And one of the members said, we understand, but uh, we'd like to know more about you, not just how you preach, but, but how you conduct a meeting. And so Jim said, fine, come along. And he, he went to his office and there he met a special friend of his, a friend who had uh, mental challenges. And Jim and this young man had, had become fast friends. And what this young man enjoyed doing every Sunday was pretending he was the pastor. And so uh, between the services, he would come into Jim's office and Jim would come down and this young man would sit behind Jim's desk and Jim would sit in a chair in front of the desk and this young man would carry on as, as if he was a pastor talking to a parishioner. And Jim would go along with this and, and the young man beamed every time he had the chance to do that. And so as, as they came into the office, the, the young man was sitting behind the desk and, and Jim sat in the chair and, and the young man asked who, who the gentleman was that was coming with him. And he said, oh, he's, he's a friend of mine, don't worry about him. And, and so they carried on their weekly routine. And when it was over, he, he left and the young man left uh, filled with a sense of joy that he brought into the second worship services he did every Sunday. And, and Jim preached the second service. And, and then that Sunday evening, he got a call from the... the um, pastoral search committee and they said we'd like you to come to St. Luke's we'd like you to be our senior minister and Jim was was humbled by that offer and and he said may I ask you what what made you decide that and they said well your your sermon was was good enough that was for sure but what really impressed us was the way you interacted with that young man in your office. And if you can care for him like that, we know you can care for us as well. You see, Jim Moore, throughout his ministry, cared about the easily forgotten people. Sometimes they're the people that are, are a bit different from us and make us uncomfortable. Sometimes we're simply too busy with our own lives to think about them. But if we're going to believe like Jesus, we have to care about the people that are forgotten who are different. And the other thing that Jesus was lifting up is that sometimes People are forgotten because of the structures of our society and culture. The ideas that seem to be baked into our awareness of who we are and who we should be. Many times, People are poor not because they're lazy, but because to coin a, a common phrase, they're on the wrong side of the power curve for all their life. 
There are many poor people who are working not one, not two, but three jobs just to barely try to stay even, let alone get ahead. The more we discover about our justice system, the more we discover that there are way too many people in our prisons who are really innocent. Oh, of course, there are plenty in there who are guilty, but there are way too many people who are innocent and end up in jail for all the wrong reasons. And there are people who are blind and oppressed because of the structures of our society. Not physically blind, but perhaps emotionally blind and oppressed. To believe like Jesus, we need to remember these forgotten people and take up the cause of justice. Justice as the Bible lifts it up is not uh, getting even for a crime. Justice as, as the Bible lifts it up is making sure that no one is forgotten, that the least of these are cared for that the forgotten are remembered. And we have much in our society to look at about that. There are structures that we're a part of that infect us as well. And we need to stand up for justice and the cause of justice. Sometimes it might mean protesting, other times it might mean supporting a cause. Other times it might mean extending a hand whenever we can. You can live and we can live in a racist society without being a racist ourselves. But if we don't do something about the problem of racism, we are a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. We can treat people fairly, but if we don't do something about injustice, we're a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. It takes good people, good people like you and me, to stand up for the forgotten and promote the cause of justice in whatever ways we can to make a difference, to get beyond the places we're comfortable, to risk perhaps the negative judgment of others, to make a difference. We need to see beyond colors, we need to see people. I hope you are appalled as I am by the number of Asian Americans who are being targeted for hate crimes because they're Asian and because of false misleading propaganda about coronavirus COVID-19. We cannot stand for injustice in whatever form it takes and believe like Jesus. It may not be joining a march or, or something like that, but each of us has ways that we can make a difference. To stand up against racism and injustice, against bigotry, We can stand up and say no when our leaders seek to take us down paths that promote division and separation. We can stand up and say yes 
when the opportunities to make a difference come along. We can say yes every day as we interact with other people. We're called, if we believe like Jesus, to remember the forgotten, to make a difference. And I, I close with this story of a dear friend who will remain anonymous, but who went to read with kids at, at one of our local elementary schools that serves our black and brown populations. What made her visits there so special was that she had to first stare down her apprehension about kids. Not kids of color, just kids. But she did it stepping out in faith and found the experience of helping these young kids to be absolutely and totally rewarding. And it filled her life with joy. How many opportunities are there for us like that, that we have to perhaps face down some fears only to enter into experiences that will bring us great joy? We're called to believe like Jesus, to remember the forgotten, those who are different from us and perhaps make us feel a bit uncomfortable. And those whom the structures of society have, have put behind the power curve where there is injustice, where there are signs of racism or bigotry or, or sexism or any of the other isms that demean people and help us forget them. We are called instead to remember all the forgotten people if we were to believe like Jesus in my prayer is that the words of St. Francis will ring true in our hearts and minds and spirits. And we will be people like Jesus. Who believe the forgotten are important children of God as well. Amen. Our special music today is As the Deer. I invite you to listen and let it touch your heart and spirit deeply.
join me in the spirit of prayer. Almighty God, we come before you and we praise you and give you thanks that you come to us as loving judge, as forgiving judge, as merciful judge, not seeking to grind our mistakes into our spirits, but to free us from them, to lift us into new life, to empower us to become the people that you have created us to be, to purify us through your love. make us new through your forgiveness. To judge us not on what we have or haven't done, but on who we can become. And as we pray on this day, we remember all whose hearts are heavy with grief who've lost loved ones, some to COVID-19 and others to, to cancer and others to still other illnesses, whatever they may be, those losses hurt and sear the heart. And we ask that you bring the comfort that only you can bring the peace that only you can bring, the quiet assurance that only you can bring. And where it might be our opportunity, let us be ones who listen so your love can shine through. We ask you as well to, to be with all who are awaiting vaccinations, especially those who have been frustrated and exasperated by the process that seems so scattershot. Open up those opportunities for all to receive them to become safe and help us as we become safe to learn and to become more compassionate and more understanding, to cherish the things that we have been missing and, and realize how much we miss them from simple human touch to the opportunity to see good friends and and family members, those wonderful gifts that, that we too easily before could take for granted. Bring the day to pass when not only our church, but all churches will be able to freely worship together, when families will be able to reconnect, when there will be celebrations of, of great joy and a sense of liberation and freedom. We ask in the meantime that you be especially uh, with every leader, help them rise to the occasion, give them boldness and, and courage to do what is right, <clears throat> not maybe what is so popular, but of what is right. and what is selfless. Make them servant leaders. And be with all our medical people, our, our doctors, our nurses, the, the staffs of hospitals, 
all the people that it's so easy to, to look past. At each and every one of our first responders, whether police or firefighters or or those who serve with, with our ambulances and paramedics. Protect them. As we look forward to, to the end of, of this time, help us to be restrained and safe and prudent. And what we pray for ourselves, we pray for all people. And we pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And we join now as Jesus teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is, is yet a, another great old hymn, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. I invite you to sing along or read the words and let them soak into your heart and spirit. <laughs> we go nowhere by accident wherever we go god is sending us wherever we are god has put us there god has a purpose in our being there <clears throat> christ who dwells within us has something he wants to do through us where we are and I invite you as we go forth, uh, whatever form that takes, to believe this and to go in the joy of God's power, 
the joy of God's grace and the joy of God's love, so be it. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to your name, O Most High. For you, O Lord, make me glad by what you've done. I will triumph in the works of your As we go forth into this week, I invite you to have a, a blessed week. Those of you who are able to receive vaccinations, I give thanks to God for that. Those of you who are still waiting, I keep praying that you will get your appointments as quickly as possible. Whatever the case may be, go forth and have a blessed week. Those who would like to remain for a time of fellowship, I invite you to do so.